it it turns out to be true that the people running our government are a group of people who govern in a way that aligns with their own values, not with yours. And those values uh, do not represent your interests. You know, they have a different set of principles. All right. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Artie. It's a great joy to be with you. I'm not sure about the name of your uh, program, Thoughtfully uh, Mindless. I think uh, you and your constituents, your listeners, are quite uh, mindful in addition to being uh, thoughtful. So I'm really glad to be with you all. Yeah, I, I picked the title because it or that name because it's kind of ambiguous. It kind of means mindfulness to me, but you can't really pin down what it means and works well for somebody who wants to cover a little bit of everything. <laughs> So I love that. Well, it's great to be with you today. Yeah. So you're running for uh, president of the United States uh, as a libertarian candidate. Uh, the nomination hasn't happened yet. Can people find out like where people are standing or is it just kind of ambiguous until that time? It's uh, it's pretty ambiguous until then. Uh, yeah. It's not a party in which people dedicate the resources that would be required for some sort of polling or something like that. And so it's always a little bit of a surprise to learn how all of the delegates feel. As you may know, or as your viewers may know, it's an open convention at which the nomination is decided. It'll take place across Memorial Day weekend. It happens to be in Washington, D.C. this time. It's not usually. And uh, delegates from all over the United States that are chosen at their respective state conventions will, will make this uh, decision. I do expect uh, to secure the nomination, but it is not in the bag. Awesome. Uh, when you say an open convention, th that means you don't have to be like a registered uh, libertarian to participate? No, you do have to be. What I mean by that is the delegates who are already largely chosen um, are not pledged to any particular candidate the way they are in the Republican uh, Party at their convention or in the Democratic Party at their convention. At, at those conventions, the delegates who attend are chosen by primary elections throughout the spring, right, that, that uh, are famously on television. We do not have binding primaries. So the delegates go uh, completely unpledged. They can vote for whomever they want. Awesome. Well, I, I do want to commend you for coming on here, and I want to let the listeners know that you didn't ask me about anything that we would talk about. You didn't try to say, hey, keep this off the table or anything like that, which I can't say for sure, but I would imagine if I had uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden on this podcast, they would have stipulated a bunch of things that are off the table or they would have wanted to know exactly what we're talking well, about. I'm sure the they time. would have, or at least effectively, they would dodge the questions, right? And yeah. to be fair... If you were Joe Biden or if you were Donald Trump, you would probably not want to answer certain questions also. Yeah. So I, I totally get that. And if you were advising one of those guys, you would you would probably try to control the environment as much as possible. So with the with the nomination still uh up in the air a bit. What separates you from other libertarian candidates? I think people know a bit about libertarianism, but feel free to share anything about that, too, that you feel appropriate. Well, I appreciate that. That is two uh, big and different questions yeah. regarding the, the, the nomination and regarding the other candidates. The big thing that differentiates me is a, a real strong commitment to doing two things that are different than what we have done in the past with regard to presidential campaigns, with regard, regard to our national campaigns. Number one is I do believe that we need to run a very principles forward platform, that we need to be extraordinarily committed to our principles, even if that sounds a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, even if it means a little bit radical to some people outside of our party. I think that a lot of Americans are ready for a very different message than what they have been getting. I think that most Americans are ready, for example, for a, a clear anti-war message. And I think that most Americans are waking up to the reality that a lot of our biggest problems are the result of bad public policy and that our government has gone off the rails. And so that's number one. 
And to be fair, there are others vying for the nomination who would agree with me about that. The biggest um, point of differentiation is the second point. And that is that I do believe that we have to be in it to win it, that we have to be running a very competitively credible campaign. And my campaign, uh, my team, is all designed to do just that, to preserve our credibility through all of our messaging on social media and on the website and our printed material. And here uh, in programs like this one being with you, we work very hard to preserve our credibility. We do have a strong commitment to a, a transformational platform of public policy ideas. But we believe that that only enhances the need to preserve credibility, that we need to work very hard at backing up what it is that we say with detail, with plans, you know, how are you going to do that? How are you going to get there? It's also the reason why we lean very hard into my own personal background in public service and public policy. I'm the only candidate who has been a professional economist or professionally been involved with public policy as a career. And that's been through two careers. I was a professional economist for more than 20 years. I worked uh, for the White House as an economist for a couple of years. I worked with other agencies. I had my own business, um, educating financial services executives and providing strategic consulting to financial services businesses and nonprofits. I worked in Washington for almost a decade in another capacity as a professional advocate for freer markets, for less regulation, for greater competition. And uh, I've taught economics at three different universities. As a second career in public service, I worked as a police officer for 11 and a half years. I was on the road in Broward County, Florida, in South Florida, all of it on the road, all of it as uh, a registered libertarian. And this is the reason I spend so much time now talking about the need for reforming how we manage police, both at the officer level and at the agency level, and why I spend so much time talking about the need for reforming our criminal justice system more broadly, including ending the war on drugs, because it's uh, an abject failure as well as being ethically problematic. And, uh, and that's sort of, you know, how I see it. I think Americans are ready for uh, a clear message that's very different from what they're getting from Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. I think uh, Americans want something different, but we're we're kind of in a position where the system is basically rigged to favor the two political parties that are dominant in our country. So how do you how do you break through that? How do you get through that corruption and Get on the debate stage if there's a debate and and really get your name out there after the nomination. Well, you're absolutely right. It is rigged and it is an uphill climb and there probably won't even be uh, a debate in this cycle. Uh, again, if you were advising uh, Joe Biden, would would it be your advice that he should get on a debate stage with? Well, with anybody, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, certainly not with me. Uh, I wouldn't advise him to get on a debate stage with Donald Trump, and I wouldn't advise uh, Donald Trump to get on a debate stage with me either. I think that they should. I think it's the ethical thing to do. But for a, a variety of reasons, uh, I suspect that that may be something that doesn't happen in this cycle. We are on the ballot already in 48 states. We plan on achieving uh, number 49 and 50 over the next uh, couple of months. So we're excited about that. That's a uh, uh, a big differentiation for us from other would-be competitors, right? We are the third party. We're not just a third party. You know, we are the party that'll be uh, on all of the ballots. The other point that I think needs to be made is that most Americans have a libertarian streak, right? They wouldn't call it that. Most Americans, uh, I don't think, can spell libertarianism. Most Americans don't know that there's a libertarian party. But the truth of the matter is that our values better align with Americans' values than the Republican Party, the Democratic Party do. And so I think that if we keep our platform principled, uh, keep it adherent to our values that we consider to be 
really at their core, bread and butter American values. I think that we'll be in good shape. It does mean that we need to completely differentiate from the other parties. Our job is not to seek common ground with Republican politicians or Democratic politicians. Yes, seek common ground with their constituents, with their voters, but not with their politicians. And so we'll be planting that libertarian flag in the ground hard and raising it high. And I think a lot of people will will find that flag. And, you know, to be honest, Artie, it's, it's our obligation to do so. You know, we as libertarians, we are, after all, the philosophical descendants of the people that put together the Declaration of Independence, that wrote the Constitution, that created our federal government for only one legitimate purpose, and that's to protect our individual liberties. If we don't lead the charge back to the Constitution, back to a government of delimited powers, I don't think anyone's going to. I think that if you're waiting for a Republican to lead the charge back toward fiscal conservatism, for example, you're waiting for something that just arguably is not going to happen. And if you're waiting for a Democrat, you know, to do what? To lead the charge toward protecting your First Amendment rights, your Fourth Amendment rights, who I spend so much time talking about as a cop. If you're waiting for a Democrat to lead the charge toward, you know, a society that is is truly socially liberal, where you can speak your mind, you know, these things are just not going to happen. I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect there's going to be a Democratic politician who stands up and delivers an anti-war message. These ships have already sailed. And so I think that it's more than just an opportunity for a libertarian party. I think it's a real obligation. Our which which uh, White House did you work in as an advisor? I worked as an economist in the George Herbert Walker Bush administration. Ask your parents. It was some time ago. Um, it was uh, almost two years. It was a fantastic experience. It was, for someone who was young and fiscally conservative, uh, a frustrating experience. He was the president who had famously said, when they come asking for more taxes, I'll say, read my lips, no new taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he went back on that pledge, which was a, a real punch in the gut for a, a lot of folks, myself included. My job when I worked for the White House was, uh, as a part of the Office of Management and Budget, my job was to help maintain compliance with the budget control law that we had at the time that we don't have any more, uh, effectively speaking. The idea was to make it as difficult as possible for the legislature to enact new law that would uh, spend money in a way that wasn't anticipated. It was a, a smart program. At the time, a lot of us who were fiscally conservative wished that it was tougher, that it had more teeth, but it has actually gone the wrong way. It's become looser and uh, toothless over the over the decades, and we need to get back to something more like that. Yeah, when when you were in there, did did that open your eyes to a lot of how it just really worked? Like, did you go into that kind of believing that you would be able to do more than you were actually able to? That the bureaucracy oh, 100 percent. And, you know, that's part of what public service is all about. You know, people go into public service because they want to make a contribution, because they want to help, you know, right the ship. Right. Yeah. Uh, they want to help push things in the direction they believe are better for the United States. And it is a disappointment to learn that not only that's difficult and each individual has extraordinarily limited potential for pushing things in any particular direction. But it's also disappointing to learn that decisions are made that are, you know, this will sound sophomoric, but every young person needs to learn that political decisions are made for politics. And so it, it turns out to be true that the people running our government are a group of people who govern in a way that aligns with their own values, not with yours. And those values uh, do not represent your interests. You know, they have a different set of principles. This is uh, an ethical problem for me personally. I think it's an ethical problem for most Americans. And it's something that, that is going to be in our crosshairs. We need to change this fundamentally. 
Yeah, you touched on something really important. I mean, humans humans have their own interests. They have their own agendas. Um, and we can be corrupted uh, actually quite easily um, or at least led toward corruption. How do you have a resilience toward that? Or how can people find, feel assured that you're going to be more resilient toward the corruption? Because I think... You know, people who've been watching politics for a few decades just feel like if, yeah, every politician says they're going to do this and this and this, then they get into office and then they become a completely different person. Yeah, I get that. Look, uh, politicians come and go and things continue to get worse. In my view, the right answer is you need to change the incentive structure. You need to change the way the system works. Replacing one politician with another doesn't you know, I mean, there there can be improvements. I understand all that. But to really make lasting change, to, to make change in the direction that we believe is, is so important, what needs to be done is to change the incentive structure. This means a, a, a couple of very uh, specific things, starting with the decentralization of authority. We need to push power out of the federal government to the state governments and lower government power needs to be decentralized to as granular a level as possible for a variety of reasons. Number one, you don't want a situation where any group of people has too much power. Number two, you want a situation in which local people have as much influence over the government that plays a role in their lives as possible. So, you know, for both of these reasons, we need to push power down. And that is a, a big part of my own platform. We're very committed to our platform. Uh, I'm running on what we call a gold new deal, which is to say rolling back Franklin Roosevelt's new deal policies, uh, including things like Social Security and Medicare, government intervention in, in our economy. We're obviously making fun of the New Deal and making fun of AOC's Green New Deal, for example. We believe that we need a fundamentally different relationship between us and government. And you do that by changing the system, by changing the institutions, not merely by changing the names of the players at the top. Are you saying you would want to get rid of Social Security and Medicare, or how would you want to handle that? Oh, 100%. Uh, they are dopey by design and unethical by execution. The idea that you would not only recruit young people, but force young people into a system that guarantees them at best a crappy rate of return, right? And at worst, no return at all. Just because the system is badly designed and you've got this huge overhang of elderly people that need to be paid, that's an ethical problem. This is not just a, this is not just a math problem, right? That is evil stuff. When you're forcing people into a system that is not in their interest, is merely in the interest of keeping a program going. And by keeping this program going, you guarantee yourself future generations of political incentive to force more young people into the system. That's a problem. That is, that's an ethical problem. This is not just, you know, pushing numbers around on a piece of paper. So yeah, I would shut down immediately the idea of bringing young people into the system. If you're already in the system and, you know, you're pulling money out, you know, not much needs to be changed for, for those folks. I would give them an option to get paid out as a lump sum. But if that's not your cup of tea, um, you know, you can, you can continue on uh, receiving your payments. And for people in the middle, people who are currently making payments, I would find uh, a way to give them an option. Uh, and that includes uh, getting out with a, a lump sum reflecting what you've already paid in. So we do need to end Social Security. We need to end it uh, as quickly as possible. So you mentioned you'd give people the option to continue getting their Social Security. How does that work, though? Like, How do you stop it but still let people get paid? 
you would have to pay him out. You would have to uh, make him an offer for, uh, you know, how much money they have put in, maybe with some interest. Um, that's a math problem. But the ethics of the situation are that if you've paid in, uh, you need to be paid out. But we're not bringing new people in. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is there's no social security fund per se. It's just there's a, an amount owed to people and then there's constantly more money being put in by workers. Right. Is that there's right? a fund, but it's only with treasury securities. And so mm. it's money that gets uh, cycled back into the government and gets spent. That's ex- uh, that's exactly right. It's a bookkeeper as, as all financial institution accounts are. It's merely, you know, uh, a, a bookkeeping uh, notion. It's not like there's gold sitting anywhere in a bank either. Um, it's all just, uh, you know, ones and zeros. But in this case, the government uses that money to recircle uh, back into the into the government. So I, I like the idea of cutting down government extensively. I think it's way too large and overbearing on people, especially the federal government. So I'm all for localized government, um, you know, local communities and then state if you really need it to, because your state and your, your local governments, you can go to them. You can actually get in touch with your politicians. Um, but cutting back on all this seems like it would require more than just the presidency. Like the the Congress can hold you up pretty well. So how are you going to navigate that with, you know, it's probably not likely to have a majority of libertarians in Congress at the same time as you becoming president. So how would you navigate this contention there? Yeah, there are pieces that you can do unilaterally and there's pieces that you can't, right? Uh, For example, um, there is a great deal that a a libertarian-minded president, whether a Republican, a Democrat, or a member of the Libertarian Party, can do uh, in in the area of foreign policy for which you don't need as much approval from the federal legislature. In many cases, you can bring troops home. In many cases, you can close bases. In many cases, you can withdraw from commitments that are just not in our interest. And then there are other cases in terms of our defense posture that do require some cooperation uh, from the House and from the Senate, exiting completely from NATO, for example. On the other hand, it is important that we send the signal right away to our NATO allies that, you know, this is your 18 month heads up that we are going to be exiting NATO and that the United States is no longer going to be your plan A. You know, whatever was plan B is now your plan A because it is not in the interest of the American people to be spending a greater proportion of GDP than you do in part to support you because you don't spend enough money. Like that's not a thing that's going to continue because that's not in our interest. And so if you believe that it's in your interest to remain paranoid of the Russian army, notwithstanding what we've learned about their experience in Ukraine, nonetheless, if you remain paranoid of the Russian army, then you do you. If you need to spend two and a half or three or three and a half or 4% of GDP on defense, then you better start doing it, right? But the United States is no longer going to be your plan A. And so there are any number of things that we can do unilaterally in terms of foreign policy that would save tremendous amounts of money. The other things that we can do unilaterally are in the regulatory sphere, for example, we can make a great deal of federal regulation subject to the approval of the states in those respective states. And you don't need every governor to go along with the idea of effectively nullifying federal regulation. But some would take advantage of the opportunity. This would create a competitive environment where states would compete to create the most business-friendly environment possible, competing for direct investment, and that's the environment that we want. Those are just uh, two examples. You can do a great deal with... uh, without the approval of the legislature to cut back on the number of employees, the number of programs uh, in the executive branch and how they work and how intrusive they are. So there's a, there's a great deal that you actually can do. 
And by the way, there is a lot that you can do in terms of budgeting. The executive branch has to sign off on extra expenditure. And so there's a, a great deal of leverage there. A lot of the legislature doesn't like the idea of shutting down the government. It doesn't bother me. I'm perfectly comfortable shutting down the government. But if they want it to continue, then they need to establish a commitment to the government continuing, not just the short run, but in the long run. And the rate at which we're spending now suggests that the federal government of the United States will not remain financially solvent beyond the middle of this century. And so it's it's just for those who are bad at math that you would say, well, we need to continue the government, so we need to continue to agree to spend more money. That's backwards. If you want the federal government to continue, you better s- shut down uh, a huge proportion of how much money we spend. One of the things that I notice, and I think a lot of people notice, is that when it comes to presidents, you know, your max term is eight years, so or a term is four years, but your max length of office is four eight years, and uh, there's an incentive, it seems, to just pass the buck to the next guy, next person in in line. So there's all these things in the United States that are on the edge of coming apart. I mean, we're $34, $35 trillion in debt, and it's not sustainable. We can barely make the interest payments on it, which means you you usually default. Uh, I know they recently restructured, but you can only do that so many times. And then there's a bunch of other things that just, it's not working. Nobody is happy on either side of the aisle as far as the population is concerned. But I mean, especially with the national debt, it's this thing that just keeps getting pushed to the next person. And it seems like if you get in there and you actually want to tackle these things, you're going to have all these things blowing up around you. And then there's going to be a narrative created by Congress or whoever it might be, the two parties. The two parties are obviously going to go at you as hard as they can because you're a threat being a third party. How are you going to navigate that? Like, are how, I mean, you're going to have to really accept that you're going to be hated in, in some way. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, question answers itself. Uh, it'll suck. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you know, this is not a job for the faint of heart. This is not a job for people who need friends. This is not a job for someone who, wants to be loved. And of course, that is why our government has gone off the rails, because it has been up until now been a job for people who needed to be loved and who were subject to those influences that you put your finger right on. The incentive structure to pass the buck on hard decisions and rather to make uh, easy decisions that, you know, everybody agrees on or at the very least that a majority of people find uh, flattering to the White House. this is all bullshit, right? You've got to be in there because you care about the future of America, not the future of the government, not the future of your administration, not the future of uh, politics or any particular politician. You've got to be committed to something greater than yourself. And the truth is that if the federal government of the United States were to financially collapse and completely disappear, I don't think I would miss it. I don't think most people would miss it. I think most of us have given up on the idea that it adds any value to our lives or to anybody else's life. It's not so much that we would miss it. That's the reason that we care about this. The reason we care about this is because a a disorderly collapse of the federal government of the United States would very likely bring down the U.S. dollar. This would plunge the world into a deep depression from which it would be very difficult to extricate ourselves in less than generations, not even decades. And the reason for that is because the dollar is the only internationally, accept, broadly internationally accepted reserve currency. So if the dollar were to collapse, we would have serious problems, and not to mention the loss of wealth created by the collapse of the U.S. Uh, bond market. These are real problems. I don't really care about the federal government itself, but the financial instruments that is created on which so many transactions and so much wealth depends, that collapse is a problem. And this is the reason why we need 
to make sure that that the federal government of the United States does not collapse. An orderly unwinding, I would be fine with, right? An orderly financial resolution that makes the federal government of the United States disappear, that wouldn't bother me at all. But a disorderly collapse is a real problem with real consequences for real people. Yeah, how how do you protect the dollar while handling everything? I mean, we have to start paying down the debt. And I know people like Biden in his recent uh, address to Congress, he'll use deficit. Like they conflate deficit with uh, the... They can yeah, for the debt. No, with, it's just, uh, debt. he's he's just someone who's bad at math. That's yeah. that's really all it is. He does uh, quite literally forgets what he's talking about. He has understood these concepts in the past, but he forgets them. And of course, he was no financial whiz when he was young and full of whatever mind he had. So we shouldn't be completely surprised that he gets a lot of these concepts mixed up, and that the White House in general gets some of these concepts mixed up from time to time. Yes. Uh, we need a cap on total spending. It's you know often said inside the Libertarian Party that taxation is theft, and it is. It is also true that all government spending is theft, whether that spending is financed through taxation, whether it is financed through inflation, through monetization and the printing of more money, or whether it is financed by the creation of uh, of more government bonds and bills to say borrowing and, and for that debt to be passed down to a future generation, no matter how it's financed, every dollar of government spending is a dollar of spending that the private sector cannot make for the benefit of real human beings. This is why every dollar of expenditure is theft. We need to cap spending and then bring that cap down so that the government doesn't decide to finance itself by jacking taxes uh, or by defaulting on debt or by undermining our currency and engaging in a lot of uh, inflation. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, inflation is horrible. So maybe you can go into that as an economist. Uh, what is the Austrian School of Economics and how does that factor into national debt and inflation? Because a lot sure, of people in this have context, never heard of that. <laughs> well, in this particular context, was it, what it means is a deep mistrust of a governmental institution or quasi-government institution that has complete discretionary control over our currency. This is the fundamental problem. I don't think most Americans realize that the way monetary policy is set in the United States, the way interest rates are set for the U.S. dollar, is that every six weeks, we lock a dozen people up in a room and basically ask what mood they're in. It's completely discretionary. This is not the way you would set any price in any market in any country, right? If I told you that we're going to lock a, a dozen smart people up in a room and ask them what the price of, you know, bread should be in the United Kingdom, you would say that sounds kind of dope. That sounds really dumb, as a matter of fact. But now if you say this is how we're going to set the most important price in the world, this is going to be the interest rate in the U.S. dollar. Whoa. Now it's not just dumb. That That's dumb to the point of evil. If you already know that it doesn't work, as we do at this point, just objectively speaking, empirically speaking, we know from a 100 years of experience that the Fed has not done a good job of mitigating the boom-bust cycle. It has not done a good job of targeting a zero inflation rate. It gave up on that generations ago. It now targets a 2% inflation rate, which is completely silly just because it can't refuses to target a zero inflation rate. This is, uh, you know, this is an ethical problem. If you know it doesn't work and you keep it up anyway, that's, that's an ethical problem. And we need to follow Milton Friedman's advice, which is to say, replace the Fed, at least replace its discretion with a rules-based system. And we can all argue about what those rules should be. But however you make the argument, 
we have to agree that there has to be a rule that says we're going to cap how much extra money can be printed. This idea that there's no cap at all and they just print as much as they want, whether it's to target a 2% inflation rate or any other inflation rate, whether it's to bring down interest rates to a particular level or not, we can't have this system anymore where it just prints money willy-nilly and then hopes it works out. Yeah, I, I feel like the Fed is one of the greatest evils ever brought upon the American people. I think that it is what enables war without the Fed, without the being able to print without anything backing it, you wouldn't have war. You you might have a little bit, but it would have to be paid for quite differently and people would take notice. Like when you're just It's printing definitely money. an enabler of bad behavior. You would still have all the yeah. other incentives for bad behavior, but it is definitely yeah. an enabler, right? I agree with you. Yeah, so maybe you can walk us through, I mean, the Fed has only been around since I think like 1970, no. A little bit before 1917, 1912, somewhere around there. I can't remember the exact year that it was created. As it exists, right. And then it evolved rapidly through its first couple of decades. How'd we get, a, how'd we get along before the Federal Reserve? Well, there were real problems. Um, those real problems would not exist today. We had real problems in the sense that the, the good news was that we had competitive currencies. Right. Uh, banks, particularly national banks, were in the business of issuing uh, a variety of currencies. We still traded in gold. So there are any number of ways for people to conduct transactions. That's all good. That's the good news. The bad news is that because we did not have the communications infrastructure, digitally speaking, that we do today, right, it was difficult for people to understand the quality of the backing behind individual currencies. And so you would have bank runs, uh, nasty recessions from time to time. There were real problems. We get that. But rather than allowing a private sector solution of coming together to create a decent currency, the federal government took over. And that's where the source of the problem uh, began because then the government used it as a vehicle uh, to buy government debt. And so to your point, it became an enabler of the government spending uh, too much money. Now, in the situation that we're in, we would absolutely be able to withstand uh, getting rid of the Fed completely we would be able to easily withstand the privatization of the dollar. But even if you allow the federal government to continue backing the dollar, there is no reason why you have to give discretion to some group of humans that are arbitrarily appointed by the White House to just willy-nilly decide how much of that stuff to print. If we were to have rules in place that kept the the kept a control over the dollar, the value of the currency would be enhanced, it would increase, it would become firmer. Uh, you wouldn't see so much swing in the form of a boom bust cycle. It'd be good for business and investment. It would be good for labor. It would be easier in the long run for people to pay make ends meet. You wouldn't have a currency that kept undermining your ability to to budget from one year to the next. It would be good for our economy. And if you were to allow private sector competition, I believe that it would put pressure on the dollar to behave even better. The people that control the dollar would be under pressure to do a better job of it. This is one of the reasons why I'm a big believer in currency competition. We need to allow all kinds of competitors. We need to allow digital currencies that run on blockchain technology like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the others. We need those to compete without the Fed getting in the way, without the Fed issuing its own digital currency, for example. We need to allow other nations' currencies to compete. You know, now in second place after the dollar, it's a huge drop off. There, for all practical purposes, there really isn't anybody in second place. You know, you've got the 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 euro, you got the British pound, um, you know the the BRICS 
coordination uh, wants to launch a, a c- control a currency that makes some sense. I'm extremely pessimistic about that group. I would not be optimistic about, certainly not about a Russian currency or a Chinese currency or even something that the Chinese or Russian governments participate in. I would just not be optimistic about those at all. Those are a couple of governments that make ours look smart. So um, I do believe that the the most likely real robust competition for the U.S. dollar is going to come in the form of electronic currencies. Okay, so you're completely against CBDCs then, I'd imagine, right? Absolutely. I think it's uh, a bad idea in terms of Americans losing their privacy. I don't think anyone should be persuaded that the Fed is going to have access to all of your data and withstand the pressure to turn it over to the Treasury Department or turn it over uh, to the FBI, the Justice Department, to the Department of Commerce. Um, The government is going to be able to access that information. This is not in your interest and you shouldn't give up your privacy. It is also true that the the Fed would advantage the development of this market um, it, to its own liking, right? It would it would bias the market toward the development of its own currency and institute regulations that would make it harder for other currencies to compete. This is exactly what we don't want to have happen. We want that market to grow in a way that best advantages the development of what we call the smart economy in the United States. You know, we are going to soon hit an inflection point in the development of the smart economy. We are going to need digital currencies to support that. And we don't yet know exactly which characteristics of these digital currencies are going to be crucial to the development of those markets, right? And for this reason, we need these currencies to be competitive so the best currency can win. Hmm. Yeah. Uh Your immigration policy, where are you on immigration? Because that's a pretty, pretty hot topic at the moment. Uh, I believe we've had more illegal immigration than the the population of New York City, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that, but. Oh, added up over the decades. uh, Yeah, by uh, by a a multiple. Look, I think a couple of different things need to be said at the same time. Number one. Legal immigration is good for the United States. Legal immigration is one of those things that makes the American culture stronger, the American economy stronger, that is even good for us financially, as long as you don't do something stupid like give away free money, right? Like a lot of states and communities are doing now. That's just dumb policy. It's dumb policy financially. It's also dumb policy from an immigration standpoint. We should not be in the business of trying to recruit people to come to the United States for free money. The vast majority of people that want to come to the United States come because they they want to work, right? They want to build uh, a stronger set of lives for themselves and, and for their families. And we should not be undermining that with this idea that we're in it to recruit people who feel otherwise or create the perception that immigrants are coming here for other reasons. Those are uh, dangerous and 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 stupid but it also needs to be said that illegal immigration is not good for america i spent a couple of days at the border last year at the arizona mexico border and i came away heartbroken and really impressed by the devastation of the humanitarian crisis that we have at our border As you may know, most people who come into the United States come in illegally. And most people who come in illegally come through using some form of human trafficking. On the Mexican side, that can be a gang. It can it can be one of these, uh, you know, what we call coyotes. You're handed off in too many cases to somebody on the American side that you don't know, you know, using one of these phone based apps. Right. And then in far too many cases, especially for young people, immigrants wind up being sold into a version of indentured servitude, which is every bit as hellacious as your viewers uh, might imagine. 
horrific, horrific stuff. This is no way to run a board. There's no way to run a policy. This is a bad look. It's bad ethics. It's bad foreign policy. It's bad for America in every way. The people who come to the United States deserve better than to be funneled through this illegal channel. For this reason, I believe that we need to get a hold of our border. We need to discourage and shut down illegal immigration. That means not only redeploying the resources necessary to do that, but it also means redeploying resources necessary to vet people into the United States legally faster. We should be interfacing with other nations' lists technologically so that, yeah, if there is a warrant for your arrest, I get that. Um, if you're on some other list, uh, you know, somebody that we know uh, wishes America ill, I get that too. But if you're not on one of these lists, the presumption should be that we're welcoming people into the United States. And by the way, this idea of bringing people into the United States and then telling them that they can't work, that is backwards. I would be more comfortable with a policy that said, I'm going to call you in six weeks and make sure you got a job, right? We should not be in the business of recruiting people who don't want to work. Most people who want to come to the United States come because they want to. It's because they're looking for work, a, a job, a way to improve their economic situation. And we should not be discriminating against people that uh, that want to work. And so we need to change that. And by the way, it is because of this rule that says people can't work right away that we undermine our own economy. When people are unable to work legally, they go to work illegally eventually, right? Yeah. This is what makes them subject to a certain amount of abuse from corporate uh, employers, especially. It's what forces them into the shadows of the labor market where they make very little money. People working in the United States for very little money, first of all, it's a bad look, it's unethical. and these people deserve better. But having said that, this is what also undermines the wage structure for people born in the United States, people who are already here, the rest of uh, America. This is not good for us. And this is why I say it is true that legal immigration is good for America. It's one of those things that differentiates us from other modern democracies around the world. It's good for us culturally in terms of tolerance and entrepreneurialism. It's what makes America, America. But illegal immigration is something that we need to stop. Does that come from the presidency or I mean, because Biden's always saying that it's a Congress problem. And I mean, it, it doesn't seem to add up. But how much can you do as president there? No, he's dopey. He just doesn't want to solve the problem. He's gaslighting you. You yeah. can redeploy assets, resources, technologically and in terms of humans from other places inside the federal government to the border to shut down illegal immigration. Absolutely, you can do that. This whole idea that you can't because you need new money from the legislature, that is, that is totally gaslighting. It is just absolutely untrue. Would you support finishing the wall that was started under Trump, or is there no point in that? I don't think a wall is the right technology. I also don't think it's the right look, right? It sends the wrong message. But there are other assets that you can bring to bear. By the way, the wall also has a problem in terms of just efficacy. You know, there's no such thing as a wall that people can't climb. You're still going to need the technology there to make sure that <laughs> it's not getting yeah. breached. So, um, you know, I'm just not convinced that it's it's good policy, that it's uh, good messaging, that it works. Um, I got a lot of problems with the wall, but in effect, you would need the technology and the humans to discourage illegal immigration, which is not even good for the people who are coming over, right? And deploy the assets as necessary to vet people in more rapidly, which would also discourage illegal immigration if people knew they could get in legally. When, when it comes to schooling, now one of the questions I did a little space on X a little while back and asked some questions uh, to see if anyone had any questions. And one of them 
was uh, about indoctrination of children um, in schools. And they wanted to know where you stand with that. Like, where does, where does Mike stand on indoctrination of children in schools and how do we fix that? Well, I think this is more of a (laughs) demagoguery than it is uh, an actual issue. But the answer to your question is you want families to be as involved with how the schools are run as possible, right? You know, one man's, uh, you know, education is another man's indoctrination. That's the problem. Having said that, You want the education in every school to as closely align with what it is that the families want as possible. This means a couple of different things. Number one, you don't want, first of all, you don't want the federal government involved at all. That's just dumb. There's no reasonable argument for a federal government to be involved with primary secondary education. This, you know, it it just doesn't even make sense. That shouldn't even be under consideration. But number two, there's not a great argument for a state to be involved, right? If you believe in public education, as I don't, but if you believe in public education, it should be run by local school boards, right? It should be run by people who are under the close watch and control of their constituents. And so... If those families believe that this should be taught, but not that, that should be reflected in the schools. Now, as a practical matter, and the reason I don't like public education as a format, is that the way to solve this is to create more opportunity, more competition, so that families have a choice. You know, I... I don't like this school. I like that school. This school doesn't align with my values. That school does. If I were to tell you, we're going to monopolize, you know, all of the, uh, all of the automobile garages in your town, you wouldn't put up with it. Whether that was run by the, by the public sector or the private sector, whether that was run by the government, or some board of family, you wouldn't put up with it. This whole idea that people tell us somehow education is different and therefore we need to put up with monopolies in our local communities and that those monopolies need to be run by the city or the county or by a school board of public employees, it's sheer gaslighting. There is no economic reason There sure as hell is no educational reason why you should put up with a monopoly of your opportunities. If you are going to tolerate, as I wish we wouldn't, the idea that the government takes money away from you in order to provide certain families with education, right? The the kids. If you're going to put up with that, a lot of Americans don't mind that. You know, they like the idea of throwing in money for local schools even if they don't have kids. I get that. Okay, let's say we're going to tolerate that. Why would you then make the leap? Why would you then connect the dots to say, and I'm going to make that money only available to one set of schools? And that set of schools is going to have one option in every community. Like, what? Why? (laughs) I mean, it just flies in the face of every economic print, everything we understand about the American economy, everything we understand about the way economics works in every community, in every industry, in every nation around the world. It's just completely dopey. It's not the way that you would do any, anything reasonably. And, and we know from other experiences what the results are, right? Uh, costs go through the ceiling, performance goes down, and the people running these programs don't give a damn about what you think. This is, you know, predicted. This is what observed in every other industry. Why would you think it would be any different with schools? And it's not. That's the result that we have because we put up with a system that's designed stupidly. Yeah, I think, I mean, I I think the education system is very broken, but I think one of the concerns that people have when you take out the federal government and that control is that you're going to have schools along the Bible Belt 
learning that evolution is just a biblical thing and it evolution isn't real. And then somewhere else you're going to have more science based. So you're going to have these very disparate educational upbringings. I, I feel like that would be one of the big concerns that people in that situation might have. Do you consider that a positive or a negative? Personally, I, I mean, I'm so against the Department of Education, I would consider it a potentially okay, positive. But 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 let's, it could say, be- um, let's say that uh, you're right. Let's say that in some town, whether it's in the south or the north or the east or the west, there's a, you know, private schools get developed and a bunch of people like the private schools more than the public schools. By the way, I don't think that that's, that's um, a possibility. I think that's a virtual certainty. And that those schools teach stuff that you and I, uh, let's say you and I don't like it, right? So what? I mean, not your kids, not my kids. And those families believe that that's what's best to teach their kids. How come you and I would get a vote? Yeah, I why, agree why, with that. Why should anyone care, right? I mean, obviously, you know, I was raised Lutheran and by a Calvinist, you know, sure. I think all the kids ought to be raised as Lutherans. Why would you care about my opinion in such things? It's your kid, right? Your community, you should be able to raise your children the way you see fit. And by the way, I don't think that this example is any more interesting, really, than a hundred other uh, educational decisions that need to be made. There's all kinds of different educational philosophies that need to be brought to bear. It, it, obviously, uh, the one that you chose is something that has been on the minds of many Americans over the generations. So I get, you know, why that's an interesting example for a lot of people. But just by the way, it is not all clear to me as an engineer who's taken a lot of science classes, that it's a bad thing to teach kids about the Bible. Right? Now, you might say, well, that doesn't belong in school. Who are you to make that decision? Right? I don't have empirical data that suggests that kids are worse off with a Bible-centered education than centered on anything else. Um, and even if I did have such data, I could share the data around, but that doesn't mean that someone should be coming to me and asking, well, you know, we want you to make the decisions for what our kids get taught in schools. I I think that's a recipe for utter disaster. Yeah. And we can, we can, uh, put too much faith in data too. Like data can be manipulated because depending on how you slice it, the data ends up being different and giving different results. So the state of faith is in decline because we have put too much faith in the state. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, you believe peace is prosperity, and I agree with that. But we do have enemies. How? I mean, let's say Iran. Do we? Do we? At least we've created en- enemies. You know. <laughs> we there are plenty of nations with different interests plenty yeah. of nations that that have a problem with our foreign policy right yeah that's not the same thing as saying they hate mike and artie yeah now there are people out there who undoubtedly hi- hate mike and artie um but that's not really the same thing as there are governments out there that resent our foreign policy. Our foreign, po- just to be clear, ethics aside and values aside and, you know, good wishes aside and opinions aside, let's just level set for a moment, okay? The following is not really arguable, I would suggest. Number one, our foreign policy as a practical matter sucks. We do not, through our Defense Department, 
achieve things that most Americans would say is in their long term interest. Right. There are there are not really examples that you would point to in terms of military intervention. The most Americans would point to and say, yeah, you know, we lost thousands of people and we lost billions of dollars, but it was worth it. Those examples don't exist. And by the way, in the case of Afghanistan and Iraq, sadly, it was not billions of dollars. It was trillions. And it was not thousands of lives lost. It was over a million. That's hard to get your brain around. That was done with your money and mine. And by the way, a lot of money taken from a lot of people forcibly around the United States who can least afford it. And done in our name, with our resources, allegedly to advance our interests. That's all a lot of crap. That's a lot of crap. Just objectively speaking, our foreign policy doesn't work. Just empirically, just objectively. Ethics aside, even if it didn't bother you to kill a million people, right? Even if ethically you're okay with that and I'm not. But even if you were okay with that, empirically speaking, our foreign policy sucks. Number two, our foreign policy is different from the foreign policy of every other nation on earth. Our foreign policy says, our foreign policy is based on American exceptionalism, that the rules don't apply to us. That's basically, books have been written about American except, exceptionalism, but l let, me, let me save your viewers time. It all comes down to the rules don't apply to us. We get to do whatever the hell we want. And what we want, according to the Defense Department, is to control the rest of the world. Now, we call that a rules-based system. Right. And we're going to be the ones enforcing the rules. By the way, we make the rules and then we enforce them. So it's not just a matter of keeping sea lanes open and making sure that trade works. It also says we decide whether Taiwan becomes part of China or not. Right. We decide how the war in Ukraine goes. We decide what happens between the Palestinians and the Israelis. All these are apparently our decisions. Really? Now, aside from how you feel about all of that, that has to be the basis of the conversation. That has to be the starting point. So when you say there are people around the world who uh, are our enemies, of what exactly are they enemies? Because most of them don't even know you and me, right? They're yeah. enemies of what? They're enemies of the projection of American power. They are enemies of the idea that the United States Defense Department makes the rules and enforces them. That the United States Defense Department engages in military interventionism almost willy-nilly without legislative approval without democratic approval. So uh, you are right, uh, you know, on the surface, there are a lot of people that consider themselves enemies of America. But I would argue that most of those people are operating from a position of resentment of our foreign policy. And I sure as hell would not want to be burdened with the task of defending American foreign policy. I agree with that. Um, and you can change foreign policy and you can, you can redirect things and make it change drastically overnight as president, because you were in charge of that. However, that resentment from all of our past behavior doesn't go away and you could, hopefully not, but you could end up with somebody attacking the U S as we did on nine 11 and things like that. Things like that could potentially happen. And then when that happens, or if, if that happens, you are going to have advisors in your ear saying, we have to act, we have to ret retaliate, and you will have a certain portion of the American public who will want revenge or vengeance, whatever it might be. They're going to want something like that. They're going to want action. How, how, are, how would you respond in that situation? 
You've got to let people understand that in the long run, we need a better path, both because the path we're on does not align with your values ethically. And by the way, you know this is true because if you were in charge, this is not what you would do, right? If you were in charge, you would not be pushing NATO continuously closer to Moscow with every opportunity. You hit. This is not something that you would do. You would not be using money to wage a proxy war in three different theaters around the world. This is, this is, this is just not what you would do. And this is how we know that they, the people that operate foreign policy in our name are operating with a different set of principles, different set of values. That's number one. And number two, you need to allow people to see that objectively speaking, our policy has sucked up until now. 9-11 did happen. You're right about that. But it happened under a regime of projecting military hegemony around the world. It did not happen during a period of pacifism. It did not happen during a period of closing bases. That's not what happened. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, people need to, to wake up and smell the coffee and have a, a heavy dose of, uh, of reality. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, a lot needs to change with regard to foreign policy. One of the things that is part of your platform is, among other government programs and uh, entities, ending uh, the IRS. So with that, I, could you? what could you actually do as president there? Because I believe that would take Congress, wouldn't it? It would. Um, the idea here is for the IRS to stand down and end the direct financial relationship between the federal government and individuals and rather require the federal government to the extent to which it needs money. And we can all argue that we wish it took less of our money, right? But just for the moment, set that issue aside. To the extent to which it, it is going to take money from us, it should have to go to state legislatures to get that. It should be getting money from state governments, not directly from us as individuals. Part of the reason the government is able to spend so much money, you know, you made the point earlier that the Fed is an enabler, right? That because of the Fed, the government is able to do lots of stupid crap because it's, uh, you know, able to easily finance itself through inflation. And by the way, easily able to finance itself by issuing more debt as well. You know, between the Treasury and, and the Fed, there's two good ways of financing itself. And the third way through taxation is similar in the sense that there's not a lot of political pushback. It's very difficult for an individual to say, I've got a problem with this. Now, you can vote differently, but if you've ever been audited, if you've ever been in a, a fight with the IRS, as I have been, you know that's not a fair fight. That's a, an imbalanced relationship, right? They have their own courts. You are presumed, literally presumed guilty until you can prove yourself uh, innocent and correct. It's, it's a, a real mess. This is not an appropriate relationship. This is not appropriate to have a financial connection between an institution that has all the power and individuals who have none. And I realize it's not a silver bullet to have states stand up against the federal government. States do dumb things, too. And the federal government could roll states in many cases. But there's no getting around the fact that state legislatures have a great deal more power than we do as individuals. And states should be the ones standing up against the federal government, making the case that the federal government spends too much money. Yeah, I like... Uh... I like the decentralized two states. I'd rather have 49 other options within the country than the same option everywhere I go. So as far as uh, term limits are concerned, I think everyone, everyone except Congress is on board with the idea of term limits. But this is something that would definitely take Congress's input and them voting for term limits on themselves. How do you navigate that? How 
especially assuming that you don't have a libertarian majority in Congress in the House or Senate. How do you push this and how do you get Congress to accept it? Well, it's not easy, um, but you are right. I believe that most Americans like the idea of term limits. And, and I recognize that, you know, from a libertarian point of view, most of us have had a problem with term limits, you know, for decades. The libertarian position has always been you should have the right to vote for whatever nincompoop you want to. And if you want to vote for the same fool 30 times in a row, you knock yourself out, right? That's always been the libertarian position. Unfortunately, I've come to realize that the power of incumbency is, is so strong and so easily corrupted, so easily abused, that it's not a fair fight in a democratic sense. The system we have now creates huge incentives for politicians to abuse their offices for political gain. And it's very hard, therefore, to unseat a existing pre-elected uh, politician. And so I'm sensitive to the argument from my fellow libertarians, and some libertarians continue with this argument, that, you know, uh, term limits are a bad idea. But I would argue that term limits are a bad idea whose time has come. It is something that we need to do to clean up a real problem in our democratic republic. I think that most Americans being on board would bring tremendous influence to the federal legislature. Sure, as a political matter, you might have to grandfather in everyone who's elected at the moment. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on board, right? I get that. You know, that sucks. Mm -hmm. Um but if if it were a compromise that would get it in place, you know, it w that may be, you know, as, as big a bite of the apple as we're able to get. But the amount of energy behind this idea is growing every year. And I think that we would be able to bring a lot of pressure to bear on Congress. Okay, fair enough. Uh, with the decks being stacked against you with a, an IRS audit, that tends to be the case with federal prosecution in general. Like I think the, the win rate for federal prosecutors is over 90% or close to 90%. And it's not because the cases are all that solid. It's because prosecutors are immune from uh, prosecution for things that they do during prosecution and many other things that just tilt everything in their favor. We often see examples of them not giving uh, evidence over to the defense. I mean, there's tons of corruption among, in our federal government as far as prosecutors. How do you address that? It's hard. Uh, you are right. There is quite a bit of corruption, particularly if you look at it on office by office, because there's plenty of folks in the business who are terrific and doing the right thing. But on individual case bases, uh, corruption is rampant. It is also true that there are a variety of elements of incompetence. You know, uh, there are plenty of uh, cases where people just aren't all that good at this, and it gets manifested in the same way as uh, corruption does. These are both problems that need to be addressed by greater accountability. And in that sense, I believe that we need. Uh, tighter oversight. I believe that we need, by the way, this is an idea for uh, law enforcement generally, not just uh, prosecutors. If there is any role for the FBI at all, and I would get rid of the FBI lock, stock, and barrel, but if there is any role at the federal level for a law enforcement agency, it is this, criminal oversight of state-based and local institutions in order to protect American civil liberties. That is the sole role of federal government in law enforcement, and they need to get better at it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, artificial intelligence, you touch on that in your platform, and you seem you acknowledge that it can be both a good and an evil, depending on how it's used. What's your general position as far as artificial intelligence is? Because I don't think you can stop it. There's no Stopping no, it you can't stop it, uh, yeah. and you need to keep the government out of it. I I do worry about government trying to get involved and doing something stupid. 
in, including running the technology out of the United States, whereas if we let it develop the way that it can, it can bring enormous benefits to the U.S. economy. It's like any other tool, right? Any tool, technological or physical, can be used for good or evil. We, we understand that. This is a particularly powerful tool. And so it makes us nervous, right? We all understand that. But who makes you more nervous? A bunch of people in San Francisco in the private sector who use artificial intelligence to build businesses? Or the government of California getting their hands on it? So, yeah. you know, it's not clear to me that the government has an appropriate role at all. Um, I, I prefer that the government not even have access to AI. You know, if the government were to say, we're considering regulating this as a dangerous tool, I would say, you're right. You shouldn't be allowed to have it. I agree with that. Um, a lot of the things that the tech industry has done that people don't like is on the behalf of government many times. Like a lot of the censorship and stuff like that is because Absolutely. of pressure. Absolutely. Of all the organizations that you don't want to have AI, at the top of that list is a government in the business of projecting military hegemony around the world, number one. Second on that list would be an organization that considers itself in charge of influencing uh, social media, right? Yeah. Deciding what shouldn't be on there, deciding what should be on there. An organization that uses your own money to engage in all kinds of activities around the world about which it lies to you. This is an organization that should not be allowed to have artificial intelligence. Yeah. As far as libertarian policies and, and your platform is concerned, it seems like there might be more appeal to people that are not just right, but center, center left, center right, and then right compared to people that are on the left who they think regulation is good, protects the environment, they like their social security. I mean, old people in general kind of like the social security, right? But they think that there needs to be a bigger safety net. How do you convince people that are more left-leaning that a libertarian candidate is going to represent them and their interests properly? I think that people on the left, and I'm not a huge fan of the left-right dichotomy, yeah, but either. to your point, people who are concerned about the way the world works and believe the government can add some value, shall we say. I would point out that what you care about, I care about, right? Um, social liberalism. Classical liberalism, we want people to live their lives by their own standards. We want people to live their lives the way they see fit. Whether I like it or Artie likes it or anybody else likes it, that's the nation that we want to live in. That's a very traditional American value, by the way. That's what makes America, America. And any number of people on the left are extraordinarily adherent to that rubric, right? But if that's the reason you joined the Democratic Party, my goodness, you and your party have gone in two different directions. Because the Democratic Party now dictates exactly how you feel about a variety of issues. And if you don't fall in lockstep with them, they'll ostracize you. If you joined the Democratic Party because you thought that that party would stand up for your First Amendment rights, a lot of my family falls into this category. Most of my family are Democrats. A lot of them would fall into that category, right? The government will stand up for my First Amendment rights. The government will stand up for my civil liberties, right? Wow. That's just not the case anymore. This is, this is not your White House, right? This is a White House that goes in, in completely the other direction, that puts pressure on media organizations, traditional and new, on social media organizations to do its bidding. This does not align with your values. This does not align with most Americans' values. This is, this is not your White House. And so I think that we need to make the case that 
your values better align with ours. If you join the Democratic Party because you thought that that party would stand up uh, against a, a war machine. Wow. Um, I'm sorry. You've been you've been misrepresented. Right. You, you know, your party just doesn't care about you anymore. If, if you join that party because you believe in my body, my choice. I'm sorry, but the Democratic Party is full of politicians who are doubling and tripling down on the idea that the state should have authority over what drugs you can use, your access to medications. These do not align with your values. You're better off with the Libertarian Party. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to hand it over to you to share anything else you would like to about your campaign, let people uh, know how they can find you, donate to your campaign, and anything else you would like to share before we wrap up? Well, I appreciate that. Uh, look, uh, our campaign is uh, is strong. It's dynamic. It's a lot of fun. We got 20 people on our team right now that are paid professionals. We are almost ready for the general election. We need uh, to fill a couple of uh, important spots. We have a team of volunteers and advisors. So this is a, a very fun time. If there's anyone uh, out there that would like to play a role with our campaign, would like to volunteer, we'd love to have you. Um, I would encourage everyone to check out our campaign at mytermot.com, which is a little bit tricky to spell because there's two A's in Termot. But you can go to goldnewdeal.org and read about uh, our platform, the, the Gold New Deal. It has its own URL. It has its own website. We take our platform very seriously, of course, already. So this is our commitment that we won't back off of our platform. It has its own website that you'll enjoy, goldnewdeal.org. And of course, the two websites flip back and forth. So learn about the campaign. You can learn about the party. You can learn about the processes that are leading up to the the. The National Convention, which is going to be Memorial Day weekend. It happens to be in Washington, D.C. during this cycle. We're very excited about it. So thanks for that. All your viewers can find my uh, personal contact information there. Feel free to text me, drop me an email, and start a conversation. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just want to say I hate the left-right conversation to a large degree, too. And it'd be nice if you could break through that and... Uh change the discussion at the very least. So I agree with you. Thanks for the encouragement. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure's all mine, Artie. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net where I have unique fractal inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at Artie TM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>